Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of On Attachment. In today's episode, we're talking about how to stop the endless cycles of obsessing and ruminating about someone or something. So if you're someone with anxious attachment or any sort of level of anxiety, which I think will capture a significant chunk of my listeners. Uh, I think this is going to be a really helpful episode. I'm going to be sharing a few reframes and techniques, things that I use regularly that allow me to feel free from the thoughts that's been around in my head. And I think that the more we can release ourselves from this attachment to our thoughts as truth, uh, the more peace we have in our lives, the more control we have over our emotions and the way that we respond and react to things in our lives. It is an incredibly valuable thing to practice and hone our capacity for observing our thoughts, being the witness of our thoughts rather than experiencing them as true and all encompassing. So often I hear from people who more or less feel like their thoughts are in control and they are at the mercy of them. This sense of, I can't, I can't do anything about it. I can't help it. Feeling like a really helpless victim of their own thoughts, almost like they're imprisoned by their thoughts. And I think that's a very common experience and you know, one that can really create a lot of suffering in our lives. And so today's episode, I'm going to be sharing a few different ways that you can interrupt those cycles and really step into a more empowered place, one of agency, where you you are the observer of your thoughts and you don't have to pay so much attention to them. And it doesn't feel like your thoughts are running the show, uh, which I think is very liberating to reach a place where you can watch your thoughts float by like a cloud in the sky, rather than feeling like it's this big, heavy, true thing that you have to obsess on. And particularly, I think when you're obsessing about someone else. Again, that can feel quite crazy making, I think. <laughs> and whether it's someone who you're interested in romantically or someone who rejected you, we can so easily make ourselves the victim. And I think it's very juicy and seductive to make ourselves the victim of a situation. And the stories that spring from that are incredibly tempting and can really draw us in. But inevitably keep us stuck in a mode that is not really conducive to our well-being. So I'm going to be talking about that today. Before I do, I just wanted to share that I am holding a retreat here in Australia in Byron Bay in May next year. We have booked an incredible venue. Uh, We went up and visited this place and it is absolutely stunning. It's going to be a three-day, three-night retreat packed with workshops, lots of connection, like-minded people in the most beautiful setting. So if that appeals to you, I would love for you to join the wait list. We're just finalizing the details, but we'll be opening up registration very soon. So if you'd like to be the first to hear once those details are finalized and announced, jump on the wait list and we'll be in touch via email in the next couple of weeks once all of that is finalized. Okay, so let's talk about how to stop obsessing about someone or something. Now, I think it's important to say at the outset that when we are obsessing about someone or something, and this is so broad in its application, because as I said in the introduction, it could be a person who rejected us. It could be an interaction at the coffee shop and we start obsessing over whether we said something weird and the other person thought we were a freak. (laughs) It could be the person who cuts us off in traffic. It could be something really big in our relationship. It could be a family dynamic. It could be something about work. There's just so many different arenas in our life from the very minor to the very major where our thoughts can run wild and tell stories and lead us to swirl around in obsession and rumination in a way that's really unhealthy and draining and counterproductive. And it really does pull our emotion and our energy in the direction of all of those things, anxiety and stress and shame sometimes, worry, these emotions that take up a lot of space within us and prevent us from feeling well and being able to show up as our most confident, authentic selves because we're so knee deep in all of that thinking. (laughs) I recently saw a quote which 
I forget who it was from, but it was to the effect of most every spiritual tradition could be boiled down to the practice of letting go. And I think that that's very true. And maybe in our modern Western world, we pay so much attention to our thoughts and we can be very individually focused and it all feels very big and important. Whereas a lot of Spiritual traditions, Eastern traditions, have recognized the mind as being very unreliable and our thoughts as being just like mindless, endless chatter that will often, if we believe those thoughts, leave us feeling worse off. So I just wanted to sort of frame the conversation there. And what I wanted to offer you as a first tool is not actually from me, but from Byron Katie. If you've been in one of my programs in the past couple of months, you might've heard me speak about this. I've been really revisiting Byron Katie's work since re-encountering it in another book that I was reading. But she has these four questions that she puts to people when they notice that their thoughts are causing them suffering. So again, this is very broad in its application, but you know, an example might be my partner's so selfish and he doesn't care about me, right? I do everything. My partner doesn't pull his weight. He just doesn't care about me at all. If he cared about me, you know, he would do X, Y, Z thing. So that kind of story that we tell ourselves that again is so seductive and we can really, if we allow it to just run amok inside us, it is so powerful and so persuasive and inevitably alters our emotional state in a negative way. So her four questions are, the first one is, is it true? Just simply yes, no, is it true? So this question of my partner doesn't care about me, is it true? Now you might say, yes, it's true. Okay. The second question is, can you be absolutely certain that it's true? And usually, even if you've been confident at question one, that it's true, you might start to falter a little on question two, because absolute certainty, particularly when it's about someone else's emotional state or something. So often our stories are, no one cares about me, or I'm not good enough, or no one's ever going to love me, or people can't be trusted. These big sweeping generalizations and judgments that we make. And when we ask this follow-up question of, can you be absolutely certain that it's true? That's a very high threshold. (laughs) And we start to realize, okay, maybe, maybe I can't quite assert total absolute certainty about the truth of this thought. So going back to the example of my partner doesn't care about me, you might say, okay, I can't be absolutely certain that it's true. And then the third question is how do you react when you believe the thought? So what does it do to me to believe this thought? Who do I become? What does it do to my body? What does it do to my emotional state? So again, when I believe that my partner doesn't care about me, how do I react when I believe that? Maybe I get really angry and hurt and rejected and I start protesting or feeling sorry for myself or becoming resentful and indignant and all of these things really righteous. That's what it does to me to believe this thing. How do I react when I believe that? Maybe I lash out at them. Maybe I get really passive aggressive. All of these things that flow from me believing this thought, this judgment that my partner doesn't care about me. And the fourth question, which is so beautiful, is who would I be without the thought, right? Who would I be without the thought that my partner doesn't care about me? If I were to just sort of take that off, pluck that out from my mind and put it to the side, who would I be? What would be possible for me if I were to let go of that thought and not be carrying it around? And almost invariably, for me at least, when I ask those third and fourth questions, the lightness that I feel in my being is almost instantaneous, right? You feel the shift. How do I react when I believe the thought and who would I be without it is a really, really powerful circuit break for me at least. So these four questions from Byron Katie's The Work to me are a really very powerful way to shift out of obsessing and ruminating because that obsession and rumination, it needs a circuit break. It needs something to interrupt it because otherwise it's like a whirlpool that just sucks you deeper and deeper because the thought affects how we feel in the body and how we feel in the body reinforces the thought and so on and so forth. And we just keep spiraling. So having these questions that you can reach for and being really familiar with them and just going, wait, 
I need to check myself here. I need to interrupt this pattern and run myself through this. It just frees up so much space and so much possibility in a way that for me at least is very, very liberating. So that's the first thing that I want to offer you insofar as stopping these cycles of obsession and rumination. The next key piece is recognizing that oftentimes obsession and rumination, being stuck in your head, overthinking is a function of anxiety and anxiety is a body experience, right? So as much as all of those obsessive thoughts appear to arise as our thinking mind. And so we try and solve them from that place. And granted, running through those four questions is a top-down approach that is using more cognitive entry point to shift our thoughts. Another way to look at it, uh, and you can use these alongside each other, is a more bottom-up approach, which is going, oh, if I'm having all of these obsessive thoughts, I am probably in a stress state in my body. I'm probably in my sympathetic nervous system, which is where we are when we're in our fight or flight mode, when we're very mobilized and everything speeds up. And I think that will be a very familiar state for most people with more anxious attachment patterns or fearful avoidant as well. So spending a lot of time in that mode that feels very intense and fast paced. And from that, you can start to go, okay, it is less about the content of the thoughts and more about the fact that I'm in the mode of obsessive thinking that tells me what I need to know, which is I need to do something with my body, right? So rather than engaging with the content of the thoughts, which is more the approach we took in the first one with Byron Katie's questions, we can just go, oh, look at me. I'm in this obsessive mode. I've been scrolling my phone, thinking about this person or that interaction or this thing that's going to happen in the future for the last half an hour. I'm clearly feeling anxious. What do I need to offer to my body to shift some of that anxious energy, to move and mobilize some of that anxious energy so that I can discharge it. And oftentimes a byproduct of that is that our obsessive thoughts melt away. So if you've ever heard me talk about, you know, in my anxious attachment course, we do a whole module on nervous system regulation and tools and self-soothing. And there's a great quote from a woman called Deb Dana, which is that your state creates your story, meaning the state of your nervous system is determinative of the content of your thoughts, the way you perceive the world. And so when you are in a state of anxiety, a felt experience of stress in the body, it bleeds into your thoughts uh, and really taints your perception of the world around you and your relationships and yourself. Uh, So state creates story and then the story reinforces the state. Uh, As I said, we can really spiral there. So rather than trying to change the story first, we can try and change our state and trust that our story will then reflect if we can bring our body into more of a state of regulation. So doing things like moving your body, I think for anxiety in particular, when you've got a lot of energy moving through you, it can be futile to just try and calm down, to try and regulate by doing something like meditation. If your brain is going at a million miles an hour, sometimes that's just not the right medicine. It might just not be what you need. So really good things for anxiety, moving your body in one form or another. So it might be going for a brisk walk. It might be going for a run. It might just be like getting up and doing jumping jacks or shaking or something, shaking your arms and legs going to the gym, lifting weights, like any movement that takes you out of your head and puts you into your body allows that energy that is currently being expended on obsessive thinking to be channeled into something that actually allows that energy to move and discharge rather than just swirl around. So that sort of more somatic approach, that bottom-up approach is another really powerful way to stop that obsessing about someone. Okay. And the last thing that I'll say about this, how to stop obsessing about someone, and this is not a, a quick fix to be fair. It's a broader you know, piece of work that you'll do over you know weeks, months, years, potentially, but recognizing that when we're obsessing about someone or something, it's almost always a product of some wounded part of us, some insecurity. And when we 
obsess about someone who rejected us, it's because we probably were already obsessing about some story of unworthiness or not good enoughness or some way in which we perceive ourselves to be defective. Uh, and so we just take someone else's behavior as an opportunity for us to keep reinforcing those painful stories. Uh, and so what you'll notice as you sort of do this work over a longer period of time to becoming more secure is that you will naturally be less prone to obsessing about things, about people, about situations, because I think that that strategy, that pattern is a product of the insecure mind and body because it tends to spring from fear and stress and low self-worth. And so I think when we become clearer in who we are, we have more self-compassion, we have more compassion for others. Uh, that whole story of villain and victim, which I think is at the heart of a lot of rumination, it just becomes less seductive to us. It becomes less appealing. We start to see the world in more shades of gray and we understand that everything is nuanced. And I think that over time, that tendency to just fixate on whatever it might be, that just becomes sort of diluted until it's no longer something that we find ourselves stuck in. And we have so many other tools and resources uh, and such a greater capacity to be with discomfort uh, that we don't tend to go down those mental rabbit holes anywhere near as often or to the same degree as we once did because of all of that other work. It's sort of just a, a welcome byproduct um, of doing that work to become more secure. So I hope that that has been helpful for you. Uh, as I said, these are all things that I have been practicing for some time and continue to lean on whenever I feel I need them, whenever I notice that part of me getting a bit noisy or chattery or trying to drag me into feeling like a victim and getting righteous and blaming everyone around me, which is not an energy that I like to inhabit. So when I notice myself going there, it's really helpful having these tools to quickly check myself and shift into a mode of being that feels clearer and more honest and more integral uh, and more empowered, certainly for me at least. So I hope that's been helpful uh, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks guys.